This video is sponsored by Taskade, a real-time organization and collaboration platform. Make sure to check the description for a discount on your subscription. Hey everyone, my name is Vishwas and welcome to this crash course on asynchronous JavaScript. In this crash course, we will understand some of the topics related to async JavaScript. Now, if you've been watching my other crash courses, this one is going to be a bit different. If you're sort of new to the channel, I would like to point out that I have a paid course on preparing for a front-end interview. This course covers a number of topics with JavaScript being one of them. I've also covered in detail the concepts relating to async JavaScript in very simple terms. I feel every JavaScript developer must have a good understanding of the async concepts, so I've decided to include the entire async JavaScript lectures from the paid course into this video. If you feel the content is helpful, please do consider purchasing the course and I will leave a link to this in the description down below. With this intro, I'll let you get started with asynchronous JavaScript. All right, we are now at the last important topic when it comes to JavaScript interviews, and that is asynchronous JavaScript. We need to understand the basics of async programming and why async JavaScript is important. Under this topic, we have a few concepts to cover from an interview point of view. We have timeouts and intervals, callbacks, promises, async await, and the all important event loop. If you are a junior dev applying for an interview, a surface knowledge of these topics will suffice. However, if you are applying for a more senior role, you are expected to have a deeper understanding of all these topics. So here is how we are going to approach this part. In this lecture, we are going to understand the what and why of async JavaScript. In the upcoming videos, we will see the how of async JavaScript by understanding and solving exercise problems on timeouts, callbacks, promises, and async await. We will wind up async JavaScript by understanding how all of them behave with respect to the event loop. With that in mind, let's begin. Now the first point to understand about JavaScript is that in its most basic form, JavaScript is a synchronous blocking single threaded language. And the three points mentioned here are really important. Let's understand what they mean. The first point is that JavaScript is synchronous. So if we have two functions which log messages to the console, code executes top-down with only one line executing at any given time. So if we have function A and function B and we call both the function, JavaScript will always log A and then B. The second point is that JavaScript is blocking which is because of its synchronous nature. No matter how long a previous process takes, the subsequent process won't kick off until the former is completed. So if function A has to execute an intensive chunk of code, JavaScript has to finish that task without moving on to function B, even if that code takes 10 seconds or one minute. You might have seen this happen in the browser. When a web app runs in a browser and it executes an intensive chunk of code, without returning control to the browser, the browser can appear to be frozen. This is called blocking. The browser is blocked from continuing to handle user input and perform other tasks until the web app returns control of the processor. The last point is that JavaScript is single-threaded. A thread is simply a process that your JavaScript program can use to run a task and each thread can only do one task at a time. Unlike a few other languages which support multi-threading and can thus run multiple tasks in parallel, JavaScript has just the one thread called the main thread for executing any code. 
This brings us back to the point that in its most basic form, JavaScript is a synchronous blocking single threaded language. But as you might have already guessed, this model of JavaScript creates a huge problem. What if we have a task to retrieve data from the database and then run some code on that data that is retrieved? We have to wait on the first line for the data to be fetched and when the data finally comes back, we can resume with our normal execution. But that could take like one second or even more. And during that time, we can't run any further code. In JavaScript, if it simply proceeds to the next line without waiting, we have an error because data is not what we expect it to be. So we need a way to have asynchronous behavior with JavaScript. Now the question is, how do we cater to asynchronous programming in JavaScript? Well, as it turns out, just JavaScript is not enough to achieve that. We need new pieces which are outside of JavaScript to help us write asynchronous code, which is where web browsers come into play. Web browsers define functions and APIs that allow us to register functions that should not be executed synchronously and should instead be invoked asynchronously when some kind of an event occurs. For example, that could be the passage of time, the user's interaction with the mouse, or the arrival of data over the network. This means that you can let your code do several things at the same time without stopping or blocking your main thread. All right, I hope you now have a fair understanding of what, why, and how of async JavaScript. In the next lecture, let's begin with the traditional methods JavaScript has available for running code asynchronously, namely timeouts and intervals. In this lecture, let's look at the traditional methods JavaScript has available for running code asynchronously after a set time period elapsed or at regular intervals of time. In other words, let's look at the set timeout function and the set interval function. Let's begin with set timeout. The set timeout function executes a particular block of code once after a specified time has elapsed. Let's understand the parameters it accepts. The first parameter is a function to run or a reference to a function defined elsewhere. The second parameter is a number representing the duration in milliseconds to wait before executing the code. After the second parameter, you can pass in zero or more values that represent any parameters you want to pass to the function when it is run. Suppose we have a function greet which logs hello to the console. We can pass that function into set timeout with a duration of two seconds. The text hello will be logged to the console after two seconds. If the greet function were to accept a parameter like we see in the next example, we can pass the parameter value as the third argument to set timeout and after two seconds, hello Vishwas would be logged to the console. Once a set timeout has been called, sometimes you might want to cancel it. To clear a timeout, you can use the clear timeout method passing in the identifier returned by set timeout as a parameter. So in the code snippet on line five, you can see that we assigned the return value from set timeout to a constant called timeout ID. On line six, we pass that ID into the clear timeout method, which will basically ensure our greet function will not run after the two second duration. So nothing is logged to the console as the greet function never executes. A more practical scenario is clearing timeouts when the component is unmounting to free up the resources and also prevent the code from incorrectly executing on an unmounted component. So that is about set timeout. It runs code once after a set period of time. If you however want to repeatedly run the same code over and over again at regular intervals, 
you can make use of the set interval function. The signature remains the same as the set timeout function. First parameter is the code to execute. Second parameter is the duration in milliseconds and then zero or more arguments for the passed in function. In this sample code snippet, the function greet is called every two seconds, which logs hello to the console every two seconds. Another point to keep in mind is that intervals keep running a task forever, so you should clear the interval when appropriate. You can do that using the clear interval function. So capture the return value from set interval and pass it in as an argument to clear interval. So that is pretty much the basics of timeouts and intervals. Now there are a few more points to highlight, so let's go through them. The first point is that timers and intervals are not part of JavaScript itself. They are implemented by the browser and set timeout and set interval are basically names given to that functionality in JavaScript. Let me repeat that. Timers and intervals are not features of JavaScript. However, JavaScript lets us use those features which are implemented in the browser. And of course, Node. The second point is about the duration parameter. The duration specified is the minimum delay and not guaranteed delay. For example, if we call set timeout with two seconds, two seconds is the minimum time after which the passed in function will execute. It could in fact take five seconds. JavaScript will only run the function when two seconds have elapsed and the call stack is free. If not, the function has to wait before it is executed. So if I type in set timeout with zero milliseconds as the duration, it doesn't imply that the function will run immediately. It is the minimum duration after which the function will run. Now, if you're confused with this point, you don't have to worry. We are going to understand this in detail when we talk about event loop a few lectures down the line. The third and final point is about recursive set timeout versus set interval. It is possible to achieve the same effect as set interval with a recursive set timeout. So we have set interval with a duration of 100 milliseconds and we have the same functionality with recursive set timeout. Basically, the run function keeps calling itself every 100 milliseconds. However, there are two differences in these approaches. The first one is that in case of recursive set timeout, the same 100 milliseconds is guaranteed between executions. The code will log hello to the console, wait 100 milliseconds before it runs again. Irrespective of how long the code takes to run, the interval will remain the same. Set interval, on the other hand, works differently in the sense that the duration interval includes the time taken to execute the code you want to run. So if the first time the code takes 40 milliseconds to run, the interval is only 60 milliseconds. If the second time the code takes 50 milliseconds to run, the interval is only 50 milliseconds. Typically, it shouldn't affect your code too much, but if your code can take longer to run than the time interval itself, it's always better to go with recursive set timeout rather than set interval. This will keep the time intervals constant between executions, regardless of how long the code takes to execute, and also you won't get any errors. The second difference is that with recursive set timeout, you can actually calculate a different delay before running each iteration. So recursive set timeout gives you the flexibility of running the same code over and over, but with different intervals, whereas set interval is always a fixed interval duration. All right, now that we have a good understanding of set timeout and set interval, let's head into the next lecture where we discuss some really important exercise problems from an interview point of view. Let's proceed to the next lecture. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to learn about callbacks in JavaScript.
Let's begin by understanding an important point. In JavaScript, functions are first class objects. What that means is that just like an object, a function can be passed as an argument to a function and a function can also be returned as values from other functions. Let's understand this with a simple example. I have a function called greet which accepts a name parameter and logs to the console hello followed by name. I then have another function called greet vishwas. What is special here is that the function accepts another function as its argument. Within the function body, we have a const declaration name equal to vishwas and we call the passed in function with name as its argument. Finally, we invoke greet vishwas passing in the greet function. So the control goes to greet vishwas which calls greet fn. Greet fn is nothing but the greet function we have defined here. So execution goes to the greet function with name equals vishwas and hello vishwas is logged to the console. So greet vishwas is a function which accepts another function as an argument. And you might be pleasantly surprised to learn that any function that is passed as an argument to another function is called a callback function in JavaScript. Also, the function which accepts a function as an argument or returns a function is called a higher order function. If I simply rename the function and its argument to convey what they stand for, on line 5 we have higher order function which accepts a callback function and then on line 7 calls that callback function passing in the name constant. So we now know what a callback function is. You might be thinking, is that it? Well, yes. A function passed as an argument to another function is called a callback function. But what we need to understand is why do we need a callback function? We can answer that by categorizing callbacks into two. Synchronous callbacks and asynchronous callbacks. Let's first talk about synchronous callbacks. A callback which is executed immediately is called a synchronous callback. A greet callback function from earlier is an example because the function gets executed immediately when the control goes inside the higher order function. A more practical example is a callback function passed to methods like sort, map or filter. In these cases, the callback function defines the logic that the higher order function needs to apply. So nothing too fancy when it comes to synchronous callback. Let's now move on to asynchronous callback which will also bring our focus back on asynchronous JavaScript. An asynchronous callback is a callback that is often used to continue or resume code execution after an asynchronous operation has completed. So in the async world, callbacks are used to delay the execution of a function until a particular time or event has occurred. And this use case is really important because most of the applications that we build usually have some sort of data to be fetched. We all know that data fetching takes time and we can only run the function we want to after the data has been fetched and not immediately. Let's take a look at a few examples on async callbacks which you might already be using without knowing that they are callback functions. The first example is that of set timeout which we recently learned. Here set timeout acts as the higher order function and greet is the callback function. When thread of execution goes through line number 5, does the greet function execute immediately? No. It waits for 2 seconds and then executes the greet callback function making it an async callback. Another common usage is event handlers. When JavaScript encounters line number 5, it does not immediately run the callback function. 
The function is only run when the user clicks on the button. If you want a data fetching example with callbacks, you can go back to jQuery if you've used it before. $.get and the first parameter is the URL and the second parameter is the callback function which gets called only after the data has been loaded. So this is the role that callback functions play in async JavaScript. They allow you to delay the execution of a function. Callbacks are something you're going to heavily see in Node.js. However, there is a problem with the callbacks pattern. If you have multiple callback functions where each level depends on the result obtained from the previous level, the nesting of functions becomes so deep that the code becomes difficult to read and maintain. In the code snippet here, you can see that each inner function depends on the result obtained from the outer function. So once you go several levels deep, like on line 5, the nesting starts to confuse you. The code is just not intuitive and only gets worse with more and more callback functions as the application grows. To tackle this problem of callback hell, promises were introduced in ES6, which we will learn about in the next lecture. But let me summarize about callbacks from an interview point of view. Callbacks are functions passed as arguments to other functions. They can be synchronous if they execute immediately, or they can be asynchronous where they get executed after some time has passed, some event has occurred, or some data has been fetched. Callbacks were the go-to pattern for asynchronously running code after fetching some data. However, as more and more requests had to be made based on the data obtained from the previous requests, developers started to encounter what is known as the callback hell. Callback hell makes the code difficult to reason about. An alternative and the recommended approach now is to use promises. Let's learn about that in the next lecture. Alright, in this lecture, we are going to learn about promises in JavaScript. Here is a useful piece of info. In about 80% of the interviews I appeared for, I was asked about promises. So if you're appearing for a senior dev position, you can take it for granted that you will be asked about this topic. So make sure you have a thorough understanding about promises in JavaScript. I want to begin by helping you understand promises with a simple analogy. Once you understand the big picture in simple layman terms, we will then move on to understanding promises in JavaScript. Consider a scenario where you and your roommate want to have dinner at home. You want to prepare your special soup and at the same time, you feel like having tacos from the food truck nearby. So you ask your roommate, hey, can you go down to the food truck and get us some tacos. Your friend says sure and when he's about to leave, you tell him there is no point in me waiting till you're back to prepare the soup. So I'll start with the soup now but when you reach the place, can you promise that you'll text me so that I can start setting up the dining table? Also, let me know if something goes wrong. If you can't find the food truck or if they're out of tacos for the night, whatever might be the reason, just let me know that you cannot get the tacos and I'll start cooking some pasta instead. Your friend says, sure, I promise. I'll head out now and text you in some time. Now you go about preparing your soup, but the status on tacos, we can say that it is currently pending Till you receive that message from your friend. When you get back a text message saying that he is getting the tacos, your desire to eat tacos has been fulfilled. You can then proceed to set up the dining table. If the text message says that he cannot bring back any tacos, your desire to have tacos have been rejected and now you have to cook some pasta instead. Alright, 
Now let's pick the important bits from this scenario and relate it back to JavaScript and promises. In the scenario, your friend is like a promise in JavaScript. While your friend is on his way to the food truck, you know that it could take a while and you don't want to sit idle. So you start preparing soup in the meantime. This part is an analogy to an asynchronous operation in JavaScript, fetch tacos. When your friend texts you with can get tacos or can't get tacos, it answers your question on whether he's getting the tacos or not. In JavaScript, this is the promise return value. If the return value is can get tacos, the promise is said to be fulfilled. If the return value is cannot get tacos, for whatever might be the reason, the promise is said to be rejected. If the promise is fulfilled, you can set up the dining table. This is a success callback. Or in other words, it is the callback function that gets executed when promise resolved successfully. If the promise is rejected, you can cook some pasta and this is the failure callback or in other words, it is the callback function that gets executed when the promise failed to resolve and was rejected instead. That pretty much is a high level overview of what a promise is in JavaScript. Let's read through the MDN definition of a promise. A promise is a proxy for a value not necessarily known when the promise is created. It allows you to associate handlers with an asynchronous action's eventual success value or failure reason. To understand this definition better, let's break it down. A promise is a proxy for a value. Going back to our example, your friend made a promise that he will let you know whether he can or cannot get tacos, which is the promise value. The promise value is not necessarily known when the promise is created. In our example, you don't know which one of them is the value when your friend made his promise. He can get tacos or cannot get tacos. You don't necessarily know that value. A promise allows you to associate handlers with an asynchronous action's eventual success value or failure reason. In our example, based on the promise value, you could decide ahead of time what has to be done when the promise is eventually fulfilled or rejected. That is, either setting up the table or cooking pasta. Hopefully, the definition makes much more sense now. Technically, let me tell you that a promise is simply an object in JavaScript. And a promise is always in one of the three states. Pending, which is initial state, that is neither fulfilled nor rejected. We have fulfilled, meaning that the operation completed successfully. And we have the rejected state, meaning that the operation failed. All right, you should now be having a fair understanding of what a promise is in JavaScript. Now for the next question. Why would you use a promise? Well, for one and only one purpose. Promises help us deal with asynchronous code in a far more simpler way compared to callbacks. Remember the callback help we spoke about in the previous lecture? Well, that can be awarded with promises and the code can be sort of read in a simple synchronous way. You'll see this in just a bit when we take a look at an example. All right, that is the what and why about promises. Next, let's see how to work with promises in JavaScript. If you go back to our example, we have your friend as an analogy for a promise. We have can get tacos or cannot get tacos, which is the promise value that your friend should inform you about. If he can get tacos, he is fulfilling his promise. If he cannot get tacos, he is rejecting his promise. And we have the success callback and the failure callback 
that we need to attach to the result returned by the promise. Either set up the table or cook pasta. Now these six points cover the necessary information about a promise. So now we need to understand three things in code. How to create a promise, which covers point number one. How to fulfill or reject the promise, which covers points two, three, and four. And finally, how to execute callback functions based on whether the promise is fulfilled or rejected, which covers points five and six. Let's go over them one by one, starting with how to create a promise. We create an instance of a promise using the new keyword with the promise constructor function. So const promise is equal to new promise. Next question, how to fulfill or reject the promise? Well, it turns out that the promise constructor function accepts one function as its argument. So let's pass in an arrow function. This arrow function automatically receives two arguments, resolve and reject. Here, resolve and reject are both functions. Resolve is a function which when called, changes the status of the promise from pending to fulfilled. Reject is a function which when called, changes the status of the promise to rejected. This is very important to keep in mind. You cannot directly mutate the status of a promise. You can call the resolve function to fulfill the promise or the reject function to reject the promise. But both these functions are typically called after an async operation. To keep things simple, let's use a set timeout. We're going to assume that for your friend to go out and text you back, it takes five seconds. So our code now changes to incorporate the set timeout. If the food truck was found, we will call resolve after five seconds. If the food truck was not found, we call reject after five seconds. This is pretty much how you fulfill or reject a promise. The final part is to understand how to execute callback functions based on the status change of the promise. Let's define two callback functions. On fulfillment is the function to be called if resolve is called after the async operation. On rejection is the function to be called if reject is called after the async operation. Going back to our analogy, if the food truck was found, our promise is fulfilled, in which case we want to set up the table to eat tacos. If the food truck was not found and our promise is rejected, we have to start cooking the pasta. I've turned those actions into log statements on line three and line eight. Ideally, there would be more code in your callback functions, but we simply log it to the console and it serves the purpose. Now I keep telling you that we are defining callback functions, but callback functions are functions that are passed in as arguments to other functions, right? Well, where are those other functions? This is the point where the promise we have created comes into picture. When we create a new promise using the promise constructor function, the promise object gives us access to two methods or functions if you want to call it that, then and catch. We call those functions using promise.then and promise.catch as you can see on lines 18 and 19. But here is the important bit. If the status of the promise changes from pending to fulfilled by calling the resolve function, the function that is passed to then function will automatically get invoked. And if the status of the promise changes from pending to rejected by calling the reject function, the function that is passed to catch function will automatically get invoked. In our case, we need to pass on fulfillment function to then and on rejection function to catch.
Since the two functions are passed in as arguments to other functions, they are callback functions. Hopefully that makes sense now. Our promise code works as expected, but there is room for improvement. What if we want to send out some data when resolving or rejecting a promise? That way, inside our callback functions, we can make use of the value to do something else. Well, it turns out that we can do that by passing an argument to resolve or reject. For the resolve function on line 6, we'll pass in a string which says bringing tacos. And for reject on line 14, I'll pass in a string that says not bringing tacos, food truck not there. But how do we access these strings in our callback functions? Well, the great thing about a promise is that it will automatically inject the argument passed to resolve as the argument to the onfulfillment callback and the argument passed to reject as the argument to the on rejection callback. You can see that I've included parameters to both these callbacks and simply log them to the console on line three and line nine. So we would now see the output, bringing tacos, set up the table to eat tacos from lines three and four when the promise is fulfilled. Or if there is an error and hence a rejection, we would see cannot bring tacos, start cooking pasta from lines nine and 10. Of course, in a practical scenario, your result would be an object or an array or any data type that your async operation returns and the error might be an object with different error codes. And in your on rejection callback handler, you might want to perform different actions based on the error status code. But this pretty much is the fundamentals of promises in JavaScript. During an interview, begin by explaining what is a promise. And you don't have to give the technical definition from MDN. It is probably better to explain in your own words. Talk about how promises are used for async operations in JavaScript. Give an analogy to a real world scenario and connect it back to JavaScript. Talk about the three states that a promise can be in, namely pending, fulfilled and rejected. Talk about the function that is passed into the promise constructor function. Talk about the resolve and reject functions and how they change the state of the promise from pending to fulfilled or pending to rejected. Finally, talk about the on fulfillment and on rejection callback functions, which let you decide what to run when a promise is either fulfilled or rejected. If you're applying for a junior dev role, for the most part, this should give the interviewer a good impression about your knowledge of promises. However, there are a few more details for us to understand. We will do that in the next lecture, which is part two of promises. In the previous lecture, we learned the fundamentals of promises in JavaScript. We learned how to create a promise, how to change its state using the resolve and reject functions, and also how to attach callbacks using then and catch functions on the promise object. In this lecture, Let's understand a few more points around the concept of promises which are useful during an interview. Let's start with the first point which is regarding then function. At the moment, we pass in the on fulfillment callback to then function and on rejection callback to catch function. But you could, if you want to, pass on rejection as a second argument to then function. The code works exactly as before. However, the usage of catch function is encouraged because of one main reason. In the below two argument approach, the on rejection callback handles errors from only the promise. However, if your callback function itself throws an error or an exception, there is no code to handle that. If you have a catch function though, even if your on fulfillment callback throws an exception, it is still caught and then you can handle that exception gracefully. So do make a note 
that then function can accept both success and error callbacks, but is not preferred over using catch function. Let's move on to the second point for this lecture, which is about chaining promises. At the moment, a promise is returned by using the new keyword followed by the promise constructor function. But let me tell you that both then and catch methods return promises. This means then and catch methods can be chained in JavaScript. So the two lines on line five and six can be rewritten as promise.then on fulfillment dot catch on rejection. And this chaining can be done as many times as you want to, which also solves the problem of callback hell we encountered a few lectures back. So the code with callbacks looked like this. The same code with promises looks like this. As you can see, the code becomes much more readable and maintainable. In fact, it seems as if the code is synchronous. We begin by fetching the current user, then fetch the followers, then fetch their interests, then fetch their tags, then fetch the description, and then finally display the data. So this is really important to keep in mind, not only from an interview point of view, but also for your day-to-day -day work. Promises can be chained. The last point to discuss when it comes to promises for an interview is some of the static methods available with a promise. The first one is the promise.all static method. Many a times you may want to query multiple APIs and perform some actions, but only after all the APIs have finished loading. For such scenarios, you can use promise.all. Here is a good example from MDN docs to help you better understand this method. In the example we have here, the first promise immediately results, the second isn't really a promise, and the third results after 100 milliseconds. You can pass in all the three promises as an array to promise.all, and you see the output as an array containing the results of the individual promises. However, please do keep in mind, even if one of the promises rejects, promise.all will reject with that error message. So this example can be summarized into the following points. The promise.all method takes an iterable of promises as an input and returns a single promise that results to an array of the results of the input promises. The return promise will resolve when all of the input's promises have been resolved or if the input iterable contains no promises. However, it rejects immediately if any of the input promises reject or the non-promises throw an error and will reject with the first rejection message or error. That is about promise.all. A slight variation of promise.all is promise.all settled, which waits for all input promises to complete regardless of whether or not one of them is rejected. So promise.all returns even if one promise rejects, whereas all settled returns after all promises have completed, even if one or more promises reject. The next method is promise.raise. This method returns a promise that fulfills or rejects as soon as one of the promises fulfills or rejects, with the value or reason from that promise. In the example we have here, even though both promises resolve, promise two resolves in 100 milliseconds, whereas promise one resolves in 500 milliseconds. So the value result from promise two is the value promise.race will get, which is logged to the console on line 10. The output is the string two that you can see here. So promise.all, promise.all settled, and promise.raise. These are some of the static methods to keep in mind for an interview. Well, with that, we come to the end of the discussion about promises in JavaScript. In the next lecture, let's take a look at how asynchronous code can be further improved 
with async await. Welcome back. In the previous two lectures, we learned about promises in JavaScript. We learned about the basic syntax and how to add success and failure callbacks. We also learned how chaining promises resolves the problem we had with callback hell. Although it's clear that promises improve the readability of your asynchronous code, there is a way to improve it even further. That is by using the async await keywords introduced in ES 2017. The async await keywords allow us to write completely synchronous looking code while performing asynchronous tasks behind the scenes. In this lecture, let's understand more about async and await. Let's start with the async keyword. The async keyword is used to declare async functions. What are async functions? Async functions are functions that are instances of the async function constructor. Now, what is special about async functions? Well, unlike normal functions, async functions always return a promise. Let's understand this with an example. Here, you can see that we have a simple normal function greet, which returns hello. When you run this function in the browser console, it logs hello. Nothing that we don't already know. Let's convert this function into an async function. You do that by declaring the function with the async keyword. So async function greet and then the function body. So we now have async function greet which returns hello. However, if you run this function in the browser console, you're going to see promise fulfilled followed by hello logged. Fulfilled is the promise status and hello is the promise value. Like I mentioned, an async function always returns a promise. If you don't explicitly return a promise, the async function will automatically wrap the value in a resolve promise. So you could, if you wanted to, rewrite the function body as async function greet return promise dot resolve hello. And the output would be the same. In order to actually consume the string value when the promise fulfills, we would use then function on the promise instance. So greet dot then, which receives the promise value, which you then lock to the console. Now you can see that the output on line five is the string hello. So the async keyword ensures that the function returns a promise. But it's not just that. The real advantage of async functions become evident when you combine it with the await keyword. Let's understand more about this await keyword. The first point is that the await keyword can be put in front of any async promise based function to pause your code until that promise settles and returns its result. In simple terms, you can say that the await operator makes JavaScript wait until the promise settles and returns a result. The second point about the await keyword is that it only works inside async functions. You cannot use await in normal functions. Let's understand this with an example. We have an async function greet. Within the function body on line three, we create a promise that results after one second. We store the promise in a variable called promise. In the next line, we await the promise and assign the returned value to the result variable. On line nine, we log the result to the console, which prints hello. So what is happening here is that the await keyword basically pauses code execution till the promise settles. In this example, the promise takes one second to settle. So after a second, the execution resumes and hello is logged to the console. It's important to note here that the await keyword literally suspends the greet function execution until the promise settles and then resumes it with the promise return value. The JavaScript engine can do other tasks in the meantime, but as far as greet function is concerned, 
there is one second suspension where no further code will execute. If we go back to the promise chaining example we had a look in the previous lecture, we can rewrite it using async await in the following way. You can see that the code resembles synchronous code and is even more readable than a promise chain. In fact, error handling is also simplified as you can simply use try catch blocks like you would with synchronous code. All right, the last thing I want to discuss when it comes to async await is sequential versus concurrent versus parallel execution. It's really important to understand this because you might be unknowingly slowing down your own code. Consider two simple functions as you see here in this slide. Both functions return a promise. The first function is resolve hello, which resolves the string hello after two seconds. The second function is resolve world, which resolves the string world after one second. Let's use both these functions to understand sequential execution first. We have an async function called sequential start where we call both the functions and await on the result. In this case, resolve hello will take two seconds and then hello is logged to the console. Only then the execution goes to resolve world which takes an additional second. So after three seconds, which is two plus one, the string world is logged to the console. Now, unless your second function is dependent on the first function, you probably shouldn't be doing this as there is an unnecessary delay of one second. The total time taken to log hello world in sequential start is three seconds. Now let's talk about concurrent execution. Again, you can see that we have an async function called concurrent start where we call both the functions. However, there is a difference. This time, we go ahead and call both the functions and store the result in hello and world. But when logging to the console, we await for the promise to be fulfilled. What happens in doing so is that hello gets resolved after two seconds and gets logged to the console. Since world actually resolves in just one second, by the time hello is resolved, world is ready with its value. So as soon as the execution comes to await world on line six, it logs that value to the console immediately. There is no need to wait an additional second. Now this is probably what you want to be doing when loading parts of a page. Concurrently fire off all your requests and then display the UI as per your requirement by awaiting in the right order. The total time taken to log hello world in concurrent start is two seconds. Or in other words, the longest time taken by a function to resolve. Finally, let's talk about parallel execution. If you prefer that individual functions are resolved without having to wait for other functions to be resolved, you can make use of promise.all and use async functions as arguments. In this example, after one second, world will be logged to the console and after two seconds total hello would be logged to the console. So this is a case of running whatever code resolves first. The output in this case would be world hello with a total time taken of two seconds. Of course in the parallel function itself if you want to ensure the execution is paused at promise.all then on line one, add the async keyword, and on line two, you need to await promise.all. The resulting output is world hello finally. World logs after one second, hello logs after two seconds, and after the promise has been awaited, we then log the string finally. So JavaScript waits for all the promises to be resolved before moving on to line six. So that is about async and await. The async and await keywords enable asynchronous promise-based behavior to be written in a cleaner style, avoiding the need to explicitly configure promise chains. Of course, you don't have to memorize this definition, but make sure during an interview, 
Your explanation covers the essence of the definition. Typically, this would be a follow-up question after promises. So explain that in ES 2017, async await keywords were introduced to help write async code in a cleaner way. Explain first about the async keyword, how it always returns a promise, and then explain about the await keyword, which will pause execution till the promise is resolved or rejected. The sequential versus concurrent versus parallel execution isn't really necessary, but will definitely give you an edge if you can explain it well during your interview. In the next lecture, let's take a look at a quick exercise related to async await. All right, in this lecture, let's understand about the all important event loop in JavaScript. Let me tell you that what do you know about the event loop in JavaScript is an extremely popular question for a senior front-end developer interview. But interview aside, it is one concept that I would highly recommend you learn as early as possible in your career as a front-end dev. It will tremendously help you understand and write better asynchronous code in JavaScript. We will split this discussion on event loop into four concise lectures. In this lecture, we're going to begin with a small recap about async programming in JavaScript. We will then go through the different parts that are essential to run asynchronous code in JavaScript. We will also see how the different parts work when executing a simple synchronous code snippet. In the next three lectures, we will understand the same but with asynchronous code snippets. We've already learned about callbacks and promises that make async programming possible. But as a senior front-end dev, you should understand how they work internally. So in the next lectures, we will see how a set timeout code executes, how a promise executes, and finally, in part four, how the code that combines all of these topics executes. By the end of the fourth lecture, I guarantee you that you'll have a much better understanding of not only async JavaScript, but also JavaScript in general. Let's begin with a recap. If you can recollect from the first lecture on async JavaScript, I mentioned that JavaScript is a synchronous blocking single-threaded language. I also mentioned that to make async programming possible, JavaScript alone isn't enough. We also need the web browser. So let's try to understand what are the different parts that come together from JavaScript and the browser to make async programming possible. The entire model is referred to as the JavaScript runtime environment. As part of this environment, we first have the JavaScript engine. This comprises of a memory heap and a call stack. Whenever you declare variables or functions, memory is allocated on the heap. Whenever you execute code, functions are pushed onto the call stack and when the function returns, it is popped off the call stack. A straightforward last in first out implementation of the stack data structure. A popular example of a JavaScript engine is Chrome's V8 engine. If you come across the term V8 engine, it is on a very high level referring to this sort of a JavaScript engine implemented in Chrome. Now the second part of this environment is the browser's web APIs. For example, set timeout, promise, XHR request, DOM, etc. Remember, these APIs are not implemented in JavaScript. They are features provided by the browser that JavaScript simply has access to. The third part of this runtime environment is what is called a callback queue. It is also called a task queue or simply a message queue. This queue is a first in first out data structure. The fourth and final part important for our discussion is the event loop. The event loop has only one job. Check if the call stack is empty and if it is, push an item from the queue into the stack. 
And we will learn more about these parts while we go over set timeout and promise code snippets. But this runtime is what you need to imprint in your mind. For the current lecture on synchronous code and the next lecture on set timeout code, we don't have to worry about the memory heap. So we can further simplify this model leaving out the memory heap. The call stack, the web APIs, the callback queue also known as the task queue and the event loop are sufficient for now. With this model in place, we can now go over a simple synchronous code snippet and understand how the JavaScript runtime goes about executing the code. On the left, we have a simple code snippet. Three console log statements that log first, second and third one after the other. There is no async aspect to this snippet, but I want you to first understand how the call stack works. So on the right hand side, we have the JavaScript runtime environment from the previous slide. Bottom left, I also have the browser console so that we can see the output for the code snippet. Now let's walk through the code as if the runtime is executing it. The thread of execution always starts in the global scope. So the global function, if you can call it that, is pushed onto the stack. Then on line one, we have a console log statement. The function is pushed onto the stack. And for the sake of understanding the timeline, let's assume this happens at one millisecond. First is logged to the console. Then the function is popped off the stack. Execution comes to line three. Let's say at two milliseconds, log function is again pushed onto the stack. Second is locked to the console and the function is popped off the stack. Finally, execution is on line five and at three milliseconds, function is pushed onto the stack. Third is locked to the console and the function is popped off the stack. There is no more code to execute and global is also popped off. This is pretty much how synchronous code execution can be visualized with the JavaScript runtime. Of course, we haven't talked about web APIs or the callback queue or even the event loop for that matter because that is not needed for synchronous code. But understanding how the call stack works is really important to understanding asynchronous code as well. So let's head over to the next lecture where we will understand a code execution with set timeout. Welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to visualize how a set timeout code would execute in the JavaScript runtime environment. On the left hand side, we have the code snippet. Three log statements like before, but this time, the second log statement is actually delayed using the set timeout function. So on line one, we log first to the console. On line three, we have the set timeout and inside the callback function, we log second to the console. And on line seven, we log third to the console. A straightforward code snippet. Let's understand how the execution proceeds. We have the runtime again on the right hand side and console on the bottom left. JavaScript starts executing in the global scope. So global gets pushed onto the stack. Execution comes to line one. At one millisecond, console log is pushed onto the stack. First is logged in the console and the function is popped off the stack. Execution now moves on to line three. At two milliseconds, the set timeout function gets pushed onto the stack. In the earlier lecture, I mentioned that set timeout is not a feature present in JavaScript. It is a web API which we can call from JavaScript. So what happens now is that the callback function and the duration are handed over to the set timeout web API, which is a browser feature. JavaScript then simply pops off the set timeout function from the call stack because its job is done as far as execution of line three is concerned. 
the web API starts its timer for two seconds in the background. At three milliseconds, JavaScript proceeds to line seven, pushes the log function onto the stack, third gets logged in the console, and the function is popped off the stack. Now, there is no more code in the global scope to execute, so the call stack is empty. Two seconds have now passed by. The web API knows the timer is up and it has to send the callback function for execution. Now we know that all functions are executed by pushing them onto the call stack. So the callback function also needs to be pushed onto the call stack. But here is the crucial bit. The web API cannot directly push a function onto the call stack, and for good reason as well. Imagine if a function is executing in the call stack and the web API randomly pushes another function on top of the stack. JavaScript can do only one thing at a time, so it would have to drop whatever it was doing and cater to the new function on top of the stack. As you might have guessed, that could lead to total chaos. So what the web API does is it pushes the callback function into the callback queue. The callback function is now waiting to be executed. And the part that decides whether to push the function onto the call stack or not is the event loop. The event loop constantly checks if the call stack is empty and if it is, it pushes the item at the front of the callback queue onto the stack. If the call stack is not empty, it will not push the item onto the stack. That is its only functionality. Check call stack, check callback queue, push if call stack is empty. It is always in this constant loop of following those instructions over and over again. In our example, the event loop sees that the call stack is empty, meaning no code is running in the global scope. It is safe to push the callback function onto the stack and the event loop does just that. But there is one key point here. Even though a function reference is what the callback queue holds, the event loop will push and automatically execute the callback function. Now within the callback function, the log statement is encountered, so the function is pushed to the call stack. Second is logged in the console, and the log function is popped off. There are no more statements to execute in the callback function, so that is popped off as well. No more code to run in the file, so the global function, as we call it, is also popped off the stack. The console output is going to read first, third and then second as you can see in the bottom left. This is how an async code snippet with set timeout runs internally. Now regarding set timeout, an important question during an interview is what happens when the timeout duration is zero milliseconds? Let's prepare for that question as well. On the left, we have the exact code snippet as before but this time the duration is zero milliseconds. We have our runtime as well as the console. I want you to pause for a second and try guess what the output is. If you made your guess, let's proceed. The execution starts in the global scope, which will be pushed on to the call stack. At one millisecond, execution is at line one, which pushes the function to the call stack, logs first to the console, and pops the function from the call stack. Now, at two milliseconds, the execution proceeds to line three, where we have the set timeout. The callback function and the duration are handed over to the web API. JavaScript then simply pops off the set timeout function from the call stack because its job is done as far as execution of line three is concerned. The web API now sees that the duration is zero milliseconds. That means the callback function has to be pushed into the callback queue. While this is happening in the background, at three milliseconds, the JavaScript thread of execution has already reached line seven. The console log function is pushed to the call stack 
Let's say at the same time, the callback function was pushed to the queue. Now event loop is on alert since the callback queue has an item. The event loop checks if the call stack is empty. It is not, which means the callback function cannot be pushed to the call stack. JavaScript proceeds to log third to the console and then pops the function from the top of the stack. Since the event loop constantly checks if an item is in the queue and if the call stack is empty, its condition is satisfied to push the callback function onto the stack. So at four milliseconds, the callback function is pushed to the top of the stack and executed. The log function is executed and second is logged to the console. Then the log function, the callback function and global are all popped from the top of the stack. As you can see, a set timeout of zero milliseconds doesn't mean the statement is executed immediately. It has to wait for its turn. Or in other words, it has to wait for the call stack to be empty. If there is a while loop that runs 1 million iterations for 5 minutes, then set timeout with 0 milliseconds duration has to wait and execute after the 5 minutes. This brings me back to the point I had mentioned in the set timeout lecture. The duration parameter to set timeout is the minimum delay and not the guaranteed delay. All right, I hope that makes your understanding of set timeout much better. In the next video, with a similar model in place, let's understand how the execution of a promise is in JavaScript. In this lecture, we are going to visualize how a promise-based code would execute in the JavaScript runtime environment. On the left-hand side, we have the code snippet. On line one, we log a string first to the console. On line three, we have the fetch API. If you're new to this, fetch is a web API that lets you perform network requests like get, post, put, delete, and so on. The argument to fetch is the URL that we want to make a get request to. For our example, I am using a Udemy URL. It's not an actual API endpoint, but for this lecture, let's assume it's an endpoint that returns a list of courses for a given instructor. We have passed in Vishwas as the instructor, so the API would respond with a list of my courses. But what is the key point about the fetch API is that it returns a promise. We store that in a constant called promise. Then on line four, we add the success callback using then method. We receive the promise value, which we simply log to the console. Promise value is followed by the value. On line eight, we have another log statement that logs the string second to the console. Nothing too complex as you can see. Let's understand how the execution proceeds. On the right hand side, we have the model from the previous lecture. We have the call stack, the web browser APIs, the callback queue, also known as the task queue, and finally, the event loop. To understand the execution of a promise-based code snippet though, we need two more parts to our runtime model. First is the memory heap, and second is another queue called the microtask queue. Let's see how all these parts come together while executing the code. Also, similar to the previous lecture, we have the console in the bottom left to visualize the log statements. All right, let's begin executing the code. JavaScript starts execution in the global scope. So global gets pushed onto the stack. Execution comes to line one. At one millisecond, console log is pushed onto the stack. First is logged in the console and the function is popped off the stack. Execution now moves on to line three. At two milliseconds, the fetch function gets pushed onto the stack. A minute ago, I mentioned that fetch is not a feature present in JavaScript, but is a browser API. So what happens now 
is that the fetch function call and the URL are handed over to the web API, which is a browser feature. Unlike set timeout though, fetch leaves behind a promise object in JavaScript memory. And if you remember, a promise will have a promise value and we can attach success and failure callbacks that will be invoked when the promise is fulfilled or rejected. You can see properties corresponding to that in the promise object. We will talk more about this in just a bit. But from the fetch API point of view, I want you to keep in mind that it has consequences both in the browser as well as in JavaScript. The fetch network request is now started in the background. But we all know that fetching data is not instantaneous. For our example, let's assume the fetch API will take two seconds to return data from the Udemy endpoint. While that is happening in the background, you can notice that the call stack is empty once again, which means the thread of execution is now at line four. At three milliseconds, promise.then is pushed to the call stack with the callback function as its argument. The callback function here is the arrow function you see in the code snippet. Then function has only one purpose, to push its argument into the onFulfillment array in the promise object. That completes line four, and at four milliseconds, execution now proceeds to line eight, pushes the log function onto the stack, second gets logged to the console, and the function is popped off the stack. Now, there is no more code to execute in the global scope, so the call stack is empty once again. Two seconds have now passed by, which means the fetch API now has the data retrieved from the Udemy API endpoint. Once it has the data, which is the list of courses for the instructor, the fetch API will set that as the promise value in JavaScript. Now here's the cool thing. When the promise value is updated, JavaScript will automatically execute all the functions listed in the onFulfillment array. In our example, we just have the one callback function which needs to be executed. But here's the thing. Once again, the function needs to be pushed to the call stack to be executed. But JavaScript cannot directly push the callback function onto the stack as that would lead to chaos. Instead, the callback function is passed into the micro task queue along with the promise value. The event loop comes into picture again. It checks if the call stack is empty and if there is an item in the micro task queue. The condition is satisfied and the callback function is pushed onto the call stack with the promise value as its argument. The thread of execution now goes inside the callback function. The log statement is encountered, which is pushed on top of the stack. Promise value is courses is logged in the console and the log function is popped off. The callback function execution is done. So that is popped off the stack as well. Finally, there is no more code to run and the memory is also garbage collected. Before I remove the promise object though, let me clear one point. In our example, we assumed the promise would resolve successfully and hence the onFulfillment callback was executed. But promises can also be rejected. So in the code snippet, if promise.catch was invoked, the callback function to catch would be inserted into the onRejected array in JavaScript. And when the fetch API failed because of some reason, the functions in the onRejected array are executed automatically. The event loop will handle the rest. So this is how an async code snippet with a promise runs under the hood. Now one question you might have is why do we have two queues? A task queue and a micro task queue. Well, let's understand more about the two queues in the next lecture. In the previous two lectures, we learned about the JavaScript runtime and how a simple async code snippet that involves set timeout 
and a simple async code snippet that involves promise execute. In this lecture, let's understand how a code snippet that involves both a set timeout and a promise will execute. This is really important, so please make sure you understand well. On the left hand side, we have the code snippet. Let's go through what we have here. On line one, we have the set timeout function with a duration of zero milliseconds. In the callback function passed to set timeout, we simply log the string first to the console. On line five, we have the fetch API call, which returns a promise. We store that in a constant called promise. Then on line six, we add the success callback using then method. Within the success callback function, we receive the promise value, which we simply log to the console. On line 10, we have an interesting bit of code. It's a while loop, which iterates 1 billion times. The code within the while loop itself has no significance. What we are trying to achieve is block the JavaScript execution thread for a few seconds. For this example, let's assume that our while loop takes three seconds, which basically means the execution thread is busy and blocked for three seconds. This piece of code is really important for this example. Finally, on line 14, we have a console log statement that logs the string second to the console. Now that we understand the code, let's understand how the execution proceeds. On the right hand side, we have the runtime model from the previous lecture. We have the JavaScript memory, call stack, web browser APIs, event loop, micro task queue, and the task queue. We also have the console in the bottom left to visualize the log statements. All right, let's begin executing the code. JavaScript starts execution in the global scope. So global gets pushed onto the stack. Execution comes to line one. At one millisecond, the set timeout function gets pushed onto the stack. Since set timeout is a browser feature, the callback function and the duration are handed over to the web API. Set timeout function is also popped off the stack. The web API sees that the duration is zero milliseconds and immediately pushes the callback function into the task queue. The callback function thinks it will soon get to execute on the call stack, but not so fast. There are still statements to execute in the global scope. So execution now moves on to line five. At two milliseconds, the fetch function gets pushed onto the stack. The function call and the URL are handed over to the browser to make the network request. Fetch also leaves behind a promise object in JavaScript memory. The fetch network request is started in the background. And for our example, let's assume the fetch API will take two seconds to return data from the Udemy API endpoint. While that is happening in the background, the thread of execution has already moved on to line six. So the callback function still has to wait for its turn. At three milliseconds, promise.then is pushed onto the call stack with the callback function as its argument. The callback function here is the arrow function you see in the code snippet. Then function has only one purpose, to push its argument into the on fulfillment array in the promise object. At four milliseconds, the while loop begins executing. There are 1 billion iterations, which will run for three seconds. During this while loop execution, at two seconds, the fetch API has the data retrieved from the Udemy API endpoint. Once it has the data, which is the list of courses for the instructor, the fetch API will set that as the promise objects value in JavaScript. When the promise value is updated, JavaScript will automatically execute the callback function listed in the onFulfillment array. 
The function needs to be pushed onto the call stack to be executed. But as we already know, JavaScript cannot directly push the callback function onto the stack as that would lead to a lot of problems. Instead, the callback function is passed into the micro task queue along with the promise value. The task queue and the micro task queue both have an item to be pushed onto the call stack. However, the call stack is not empty, so both of them have to wait for their turn. The time advances to three seconds and while loop is still executing. At 3.4 seconds, that is three seconds after the while loop started, the while loop completes and is popped off the stack. Now, can the callback functions execute? No, there is one more line of code to execute first. So at 3.41 seconds, execution is at line 14. The log function is pushed onto the stack, the string second is logged in the console, and then the function is popped off the stack. Now, finally, we have no more code to run and the call stack is empty. Both the queues contain an item and the call stack is also empty, which means the event loop can now push an item from the queue onto the stack. But the question is, which item to push? Well, the set timeout callback was the first one to be queued in the task queue and it has been waiting there for three and a half seconds now. So it would be correct to first execute that, right? Well, that is where we are wrong. JavaScript gives a priority to the micro task queue over the task queue. So it is the callback function from the promise that gets pushed onto the call stack first. Within the callback function, we have the log function, which logs the promise value to the console and then gets popped off. The callback function also gets popped. The call stack is empty again and the micro task queue is also empty, which means the callback function in the task queue is now pushed onto the stack. The log function within the call stack is then pushed, which logs first to the console and then popped off the stack. The callback function is also popped off and there is no more code to execute. This is how a code snippet featuring both set timeout and a promise will run under the hood. When it comes to the event loop, it has two main tasks. Check the call stack. If empty, push item in the micro task queue onto the call stack. If the micro task queue is also empty, push item from the task queue onto the call stack. Repeat this forever. All right, with that, I hope you now have a clear understanding of the event loop and how to explain it during an interview. Well, with that, we come to the end of this crash course on async JavaScript. If you've enjoyed the video, please do leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content on web development.